Everybody had a good week. Just to let y'all know, I am undefeated at the Bartow Golf Course. I have beaten Stephen <laughs> twice. <laughs> and he will be here the first Sunday of November to preach with us. So y'all make sure y'all let him know because it's the only place I seem to be able to beat him. <laughs> and, uh, he has a different story, though. All right. Yes, this will be different. Oh, he, oh trust me, he tried. It didn't work, though. So that is... It was so funny that when I left, I have a golf ball in between my windshield and my wiper blade, and I'm like, really, Steven? Mm. Oh, wow. so, uh, but no, it was fun. We, it was me, him, Chase, and Tim Hunter went yesterday, and it was fun. We had a good time. The weather was perfect. Try to get a pitch and don't let your guard down. <laughs> <laughs> hey, like I said, everywhere we go, he always comes back at the end and gets me, but this time, no, no. He even tried his best to get into my head, and it didn't work. I was, I was focused. I beat him by, what was it, two shots? Two, two or three? I figured you wouldn't go play no more. He didn't let you win. He says he don't want to go back there no more. He says he can't win there. So I'm like, well, that's that's the only place we're going to start playing. So we ain't going to go nowhere else. And he started laughing. But Well, this one is working for a living. And the theme is standing firm in integrity. So God wants his people to be hard workers doing what is good and right at all times, lovingly holding each other accountable for ongoing disobedience. We all know that we should be praying for one another. We need to work to support ourselves. Man, if we could just, if the world could learn that today. I am so tired of working for other people to stay home. It's just getting old. Believers hold each other accountable for ongoing disobedience. Hebrews 11.6 says, But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Notice what that says. He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Not people that just have a... Whatever kind of relationship. They have to diligently make it a point to constantly seek him. He'll reward you for it. And in James 1, says, But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. Now this lesson is set around A.D. 51, as Paul wrote to the new believers, because they had some questions and situations that they were facing. 
So he followed Christ's command to make disciples, teaching them all that Christ had commanded them. Remember, we are to make disciples. Amen. We preached on that here recently. That's the Great Commission. Jesus told us to go out and make disciples. So what comes to mind when you hear somebody mention the welfare system? Abuse. Abuse. Stamps. They got cards now. <laughs> EBT card. It, it kind of aggravates me when I go to the grocery store and they have better food in their, <coughs> their buggy, but they pay cash for their beer mm -hmm. and their alcohol. And I'm thinking, so I'm paying so they can fill up their buggy with stuff better than I get. So they can pay for their alcohol. I said, I don't think that's right. Mm -hmm. uh, but there are some positives because there are some people that truly need help. Yes. And those are the ones, unfortunately, at times fall through the cracks and don't get what they need. Um, and, that, and that's the sad part. Especially the elderly. Yeah. Right. They do. And, and it, it just aggravates me when, yeah. I mean, the system's been broke for years. There's no, no fix. They're not going to fix it. Okay. It's, it is what it is, unfortunately. And this is what I tell people when it comes to these people sitting on the, at every intersection you go to, it's funny how they can sit there all day in the sun, but they can't go get a job and work in air conditioning, but they can walk up and down begging for money. And most of those people drive cars better than you have. Be careful because they park it down farther and if you stay around and watch them go majority of them have vehicles better than what you and I drive um, but it's just one of those things that people are always going to be out there to ruin it for other people but as this says with many topics there are both positive and negative aspects to our system unfortunately now the Bible balances caring for those truly in need and avoiding abuse of that care so today we're going to see what God's Word has to say about working and how to respond to those who are capable of working but choose not to. We've all heard the saying, idle hands are the devil's tools. And the Bible talks about being busy and productive and also about being lazy and unproductive. So we're going to see what God says about this today in His Word. Anybody want to read 2 Thessalonians 3, 1-5? through 5? Finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may have free course and be glorified, even as it is with you. And that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men, for all men have not faith. But the Lord is faithful, who shall establish you and keep you from evil and we have confidence in the Lord touching you that ye both do and will do the things which we command you and the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God and into the patient waiting for Christ so as Paul prepared to close his second letter to the Thessalonians, he asked them to pray for him. Now it is true that God is interested even in the little things of our lives. In this case, however, Paul desired prayer for a very important task. He continued to drive forward with the gospel and wanted the message of Christ to find acceptance among others, just as it did to the Thessalonians. It would not happen without prayer. He needs involved protection from the enemies of the gospel, which are the wicked and evil men. Paul reminded the Thessalonians that the world was full of people who had no faith in God. So we need to pray for one another because we are engaged in a spiritual warfare. Verse 3 continued the theme of faith and faithfulness. Paul contrasted the lack of faith among the gospel's enemies with the faithfulness of the Lord himself. 
Now God's faithfulness gave Paul confidence that the work of the gospel among them would continue. And he prayed that God's work among them would lead them to God's love and also Christ's perseverance. So when Paul indicated in verse 3 that God would strengthen and protect believers, he looked both inward and outward. Now inwardly, God strengthens his people. He strengthens our faith. We should pray for this, understanding that he wants to strengthen us. It is in his interest to strengthen us. Think of how much he has invested in humanity over the years of human history. We may also pray for protection from outside threats, knowing that God will not abandon us to evil or to the evil one. And he did, he says, God did not do all that he has done in Israel's history, in Christ's work, and in Christian history since then, just to let us fall to an overpowering enemy. Kind of like a song that Jeff and Steph sings that he didn't bring us this far to leave us. Remember, God's not done with us yet. The instructions that Paul was about to give the Thessalonians would be difficult, involving an element of personal confrontation. They would only be able to follow those instructions effectively if they had great love and perseverance. <clears throat> Now, any hope that we have of living with integrity will require prayer and encouragement from other believers. This is why I keep harping on not to forsake the assembly of ourselves together. We have to do this together. Because what we learned Wednesday night was the enemy loves to get you by yourself. And he loves to get you when you're down. So he can start talking to you and tell you things that aren't true. So that the first thing you do is walk away from God instead of walking towards him. Now they will in turn need ours. So church leaders need the prayers of those whom they lead and the people of the congregation need the prayers of their leaders. So we can take Paul's instructions to heart and look to the Lord's faithfulness to strengthen us. We can also be confident that he will direct our hearts into his love and perseverance. He will always strengthen us and protect us. Why? Because we matter to him. We must take time daily to pray for other people's needs, not just us. We need to get off of self sometimes and just start praying for other people. So why is fellowship with other believers necessary for effective prayer? I feel like um, when we're together like this and we, um, we kind of know each other and... Um, we, we can know what to pray for them. If they're going to have a burden or something, or they mention a prayer request, we know specifically what to bring to the Father for them. Anybody else? If you don't know about it, you can't pray about it. Right. And it's not necessarily the person has to tell you everything, or they don't even have to tell you what it is. They can just say, I have a very special unspoken prayer request. Remember what I said Wednesday night? <clears throat> Be careful what you say to some people, mm -hmm. especially when you say, please don't say nothing. People are still going to say something. I said, if you're going to vent, if you're going to gossip, or you're going to break your promise to somebody, break it to God. That should be the only person you talk to about it. Okay? If, if you're not willing, say you have an alt against your brother and you're not willing to go to them, then go to God about it. Don't go to other people. Then, and ask God to help you to go to that brother or sister so you can make things right. But it's one of those things that I tell people. It, it, it's kind of like some parts of my job that um, when I'm on doing stuff with our, our SISM team, we, we tell people flat up right at the very beginning, everything's confidential. Unless you say something that becomes suicidal, or homicidal in nature you know if you say something uh, there's some things that we just can't stay quiet about you know and it's one of those things that that's why I tell people be careful what you say to other people okay there's only I, I can only probably three people that I can fully trust okay and it's one of those things that you're gonna have people in your life that God's gonna send that you're gonna know deep down yes you know, this is this is somebody kind of like my rock I can trust. You know, it's one of those things that you got to be careful because the devil 
When you say it, he hears it. The devil cannot read your mind. Don't See, a lot of people think he can read your mind and your thoughts. He cannot. He does not have that capability, but he can hear what you say. Okay? And it's one of those things. He might put thoughts in your mind, but he don't know what you're thinking. Okay? He's not God. He, he does not have that capability. Nowhere in the Bible have I read where he can do that. So you got to think about that. So when has God answered one of your prayers for someone else? And how did that feel? Maybe you've been praying for somebody or something for somebody. Anybody? I've been praying for a friend. Every day to get better. And she's here. Yep. <laughs> Anybody else? I just go through the list of names of everybody at church. And I just lay there and name them out. Especially if Gail is what she's going through. Pray for me. Pray for it's hard not to put my name in there. But just pray for everybody. Just name them out. Yep. Gotta just keep praying for people. You know, and and, the, and this is why I tell y'all, you might not remember all the prayer requests that are mentioned. And you might not write them down. And that's fine. But if God puts something on your heart at a certain time, there's a reason. Okay? Pray for that person. Okay, because I y'all don't really I get a lot of text messages and a lot of calls throughout the week from people within the church asking for certain prayers or something. Trust me, God knows all about it. I might not put them out on a calling post at that point unless God tells me to. Um, and a lot of times they just say, "Hey, will you just pray for me?" Okay, I can do that. But I tell people all the time that if they come to me and they want me to pray that God does something in their life. But they're not living their life for God. This is how I pray. Lord, get their attention. And then hear their prayer. Because you got to realize when we have sin in our lives, God cannot hear our prayers until we repent. You say, well, that's not true. Yeah, it is. Jesus was on the cross and God couldn't look on him because he had our sin. So God had to turn his back on his own son because God is holy. He cannot look on sin. He can't. And if we're living a sinful lifestyle or a sinful whatever, and we want God to bless us, God cannot bless sin. Remember that. He can't. And I don't pray somebody out. Everybody's like, I, I just say, Lord, your will be done ultimately draw them closer to you because everybody thinks we can pray people out of situations listen you're not going to pray them out of something god's put them in okay you're not going to do it you're not changing god's mind i can promise you that but just pray that god keeps them safe and strengthens them i mean kind of like a situation i have in my own personal life i just pray that god keeps a certain person healthy keep them healthy keep them safe but at the same time get their attention because it's that serious their soul it means that much i think uh david walked over that way the missionary he's been no, he wasn't he's, he's bringing coming stuff in, in the front door he's been coming in and out he just looked through that door and then walked that way uh -huh. he's gonna realize this is the well i know part of his family that's his front. wife and his son. Yeah, get the other door. yeah i just he walked that way. Who wants to read 6 through 12? 2 Thessalonians 6 through 12. I'll read it. Now we command you, brethren, in the name of our, our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye withdraw on the of yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly, and not after the tradition which he received us. For yourselves know how ye ought to follow us. For we behaved not ourselves disorderly among you, neither did we eat any man's bread for not, but wrought with labor and, tra and tra is it travail? Travail. travail night and day, that we might not be chargeable to any of you. Not because we have not power, we have not power, but to make ourselves an in, in 
unto you to follow us. For even when we were with you, this this we commanded you that if any word any any would not walk, neither should he eat. For we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly, working not at all, but are busybodies. Now that there are such, we command and exhort by our Lord Jesus Christ that with quietness they work and eat their own bread. But yea, brethren, be not weary in well-doing, and if any man obey not our word by this if episode, oh, if episode? Epistle. Okay. Note that man, and have no company with him, that he may be ashamed, yet count him not as an enemy, but at admonish him as a brother. So Christian unity was important for Paul. And he always encouraged it. In verse 6, however, he told the church to separate from a certain group, those who were idle. Now, living an idle life did not fit with the teaching that Paul had given the church. So let us put it bluntly. Idleness is a sin, and it produces all kinds of harm. To be idle is not in keeping with the character of God in whose image we are made. God remains forever the ultimate creator. Now, the idol... They bring harm to themselves by engaging in behavior at odds with God's purposes for them. They bring harm to the truly needy by soaking up resources that should help others. We were talking about that earlier. They bring harm to other believers who grow tired and cynical because of the abuse of their generosity. We had some families do that to us. And it's sad because you try to be Christ-like to somebody and they take advantage of you. I'm the type that you take advantage, that's the last time. Now, I will do what God tells me to do the first time. And if it backfires and I find out that somebody took advantage, that's when the deputy comes out in me and I will not help you a second time. Sorry, can't do it. I cannot allow God's resources to be taken advantage of when other people could use them. I mean, I will do what's right at first, and I will do it in love, praying that it all works out. But if in the end it doesn't, then I move on to the next one that needs it, and I help them. And it says, and they also bring harm to unbelievers who are repulsed from Christian faith by what they see in the lives of the idol. Now, Paul reminded them of his own example. Now, while living among them, he and his companions did not live off the labor of the Thessalonians, even though they had the right to do so. They paid their own way. Now, he insisted on not being a burden to them, even when it required him to, lo to work long hours, days, and nights. Verse 9 shows us that this conduct resulted from his conscious decision to live such an example before them. He had instructed them that those who would not work were not to eat. That is so true. This is the way I look at it. And I know I, it really, I don't believe it says man or woman, it says on, on here. It says, but what I believe, because it says for even when we were with you, this we commanded you that if any would not work, neither should he eat. This is why they get it as a man, because I say the word he. The man in the, in the household is supposed to be the one that takes care of the family. That was the way God orchestrated the man. One of his roles is one, we got to take, take care of the wife, because the wife, you know, is a helpmate. The man's supposed to be superior as long as God is superior over him. But if a man does not work, he, you know, the Bible says he's worse than an infidel. And that word infidel means unbeliever. How can you be worse than somebody that don't believe in God? But we have a lot of people out there that don't do that. Now, granted, there are some that physically they might not be able, and that's fine. They still do other things. But if they are one that just sits around and does absolutely nothing, but expects everything, that's not right. And God will have the final say on that part. And Paul reminded them that, of that many, many times. So why did Paul believe that the Thessalonians needed this example from the very beginning? Well, perhaps he suspected idleness would be a problem within this group. We can't say for sure, but it is clear, however, that the Roman Empire had a developing problem of idleness on its hands. 
An increasing portion of its population lived off the generosity of the state. Now, this was happening back in A.D. 51. It's still happening in 2021. People living off the government instead of doing what they need to do when they know they are physically and mentally capable of doing it. So believers should never align themselves with idle busybodies. But we are to be generous with God's blessing that he's given us. Even after such instructions among the Thessalonians, Paul heard that some of them were still idle. They were not busy earning a living, but rather were busybodies. They could not be bothered to take care of their own affairs, but they apparently tried to run the affairs of everybody else. I've seen that too. The honor of the gospel was at stake. In verse 12, Paul commanded such people to settle down and pay their own way as well. Now, it is important to engage in hard work, whether we be in the white collar or blue collar jobs. It is important to instill within our children a respect for those who work hard. They should learn the value of earning a living. You know, it's one of those things that if you... And, and I learned this later on in life as my, myself, you know, growing up, I took care of my stuff. I didn't want nobody breaking my toys, messing with my stuff, because that, that was my stuff. Mm -hmm. That's true. And then when I had to start paying for my stuff, it even got a little work, because I'm like, no, I'm paying for this. You know, and it, it taught me to take care of what I had, because I'm working for it. You know, we, it, I'm not just out there working to just blow money and throw it away. And it makes you respect what you have especially if you're taught that at a young age today we have a lot of families where everything's just give 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 and you're and the kids aren't being taught one respect two how to appreciate things because it's just handed to them it's given because if they cry oh i've seen it in stores oh my gosh <laughs> and and the worst commercial they got out now is that craft commercial where the kid at the table says, I'm not going to eat that. That's a hero matter. And yeah, and, and then all of a sudden they do the cheese. Man, yeah. no, that would have been a backhand right to the mouth. <laughs> One, don't talk like that to your mother. And it'd be like, you can sit there all night and I'll wake you up in the morning or you can eat what I put down there. So what did that commercial just teach kids? Well, that's all I've got to do. Well, they did it on TV, and I can get what I want. And that's what the world's come to today. And that goes totally against the Word of God. I mean, it's one of those things. And we got to realize that we're they're learning that somewhere. A lot of it's not always on TV, unfortunately. A lot of it's from home. You know, because the parents are teaching them that. Why? Because the parents didn't learn it. Or they learned it. And always said, well, I won't do my kids that way. It worked for you. You know, getting your hiney tore up when you were young didn't kill you. You know, it made you better. Nowadays, it's this timeout thing. Timeout's just job security for me. That's all that is. Because the Bible says if you spare the rod, you hate your son. It does not say the word spoil. And when people say that, I'm like, it's not what the word of God says. It says you hate your son. The word hate is a lot. And uh, God chastises us, and we don't like it, but it's always to bring us closer to him to teach us something. It's never to hurt us. It's never to, I'm just going to uh, chastise you out of anger. That's not how God works. Even though the devil may whisper that in your ears, look at, look at well, what did we do to deserve it? What choice did we make? It must have been a bad choice because we're suffering the consequences for it. If it was a good choice, you would reap the benefits. So we have to realize that. Now, back in this time, there were three classes of workers that existed during the Roman Empire. There were free, serfs, and slaves. Now, slaves literally belonged to their masters. Serfs, which is S-E-R-F-S, -E were not much better off. They belonged to a particular area or a land. Now, they were free to manage their own work, but not to move around or move away at will. Now, free men could choose their own work and were, of course, responsible for their own needs and expenses. Now, many free people considered it beneath their dignity to 
to have to work with their hands. So they avoided manual labor. Man, that, man, I could open up a whole can of worms right there. But this generation today that don't want to work, it just, I was excited at 14 years old to be working at Carvel Ice Cream Store at night by myself closing. One, I got to eat all the ice cream I don't want. <laughs> okay? And then I moved to a dishwasher at Hunan's Chinese restaurant because every night we got fed Chinese food for free. <laughs> I didn't mind doing dishes. I knew I was getting a big supper. <laughs> and, of course, I worked at McDonald's. I didn't mind it. You know, I, it, I did think because I wanted to have money to be able to buy things I wanted. And it's one of those things that we live in a world today that these kids, oh my gosh. It, I remember when I started working, I granted, this was a long time ago. You are like saying, yeah, right. Minimum wage, I think I was making $2 and something an hour when I worked at Carville when I was only 14. Now, they're complaining because they're saying 15 an hour is not enough. Well, of course, everything else has went up. I understand that. But at the same time, my pay hasn't went up, and I'm maxed out. And I have people saying, I should make what you make, and all they have is a high school diploma and no experience. And maybe been working a year. And I've been working at my position 26 years. That That's the society we live in today. It's, it's one of those things that, I mean, look at what happened with this pandemic. People not wanting to go back to work. Why? They were making more money to sit at home from unemployment than they were to go back to work. That's wrong. When a government will do something like that, that's wrong. I mean, the, the reason for unemployment is to help you until you get another job. Not to show you that you don't have to get another job. That That's, that's the whole difference. And... A lot of people suffered from that, and a lot of people were hurt. A lot of businesses closed. And it's sad that we live in a society, but you know what? This was happening back in Paul's days. So it should not be anything to us going, huh, I can't believe this is happening. This ain't never happened before. What's well, happened since Paul? And guess what? It's going to continue happening. There's nothing you and I are going to do about it to change it, except we try to instill it in our families and our children, our grandchildren, or whatever, the true values of life. I mean, one's gotta start with God, okay? And then two, you gotta teach them respect. You gotta teach them how to care for things, how to care for others. That's that's what it's all about. And if we get to that, then we're gonna, we're gonna see a difference because you know what? We're not gonna change society, but we can change each other. And then once we, be that example, then others may want to do it, but all you can do is really change you. So we have to just try to do our best. So now the Roman policies created an underclass that had to be fed and entertained to keep from rioting. Now people who came to Christ from such a life did not automatically lose the mentality that they had developed. It obviously took some time. So as we can see in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, it even took the apostolic intervention before those attitudes became adjusted. Now we find it hard to maintain balance in this area. On one hand, we are to be generous with others. But at the same time, we are not to take advantage of that just generosity. We will meet people who suffer through no fault of their own, and we must show them love of Christ by helping them. But we also have a duty to do all that we can to avoid putting ourselves in a situation where we will rely on the productivity of others. We want to work hard as God grants us the ability to extend generosity and to avoid having to accept generosity. Now what I say about that, listen, I've always been told this by a preacher. Don't steal somebody else's blessing. If somebody wants to do something nice for you, that is fine. Let them do it, but don't expect it all the time. You know, let them do it because that might be something God's told them to do to bless you. And then what can you do? Turn right around and bless somebody else. Mm -hmm. You know, keep that blessing going. Just because they blessed you, whether they did something for you or they, they bought a meal for you or they sent you a card of money, that's fine. Okay? 
Then say, God, who can I bless now? Put somebody on my heart that really needs a blessing. And then turn right around and bless them. Keep that blessing going. Remember I said you can't outgive God, but it's fun to try. It really is. Now living off the charity of others is only one way that is only one way to display idleness and laziness. But a person can display idleness and laziness at work, in their studies, in their schoolwork, and parenting, in disciplines of good health, such as exercise and eating habits. Remember, our body's a temple, and in civic life and duty. So we come across it in nearly every area of life. We must work hard to provide for yourself and to have resources to help the truly needy. So why is it better for us and for others if we work hard to earn a living? Why is that better for us to do so? Say that again now. Why is it better for us and for others if we work hard to earn a living? I will hand you that don't get in trouble. I always had to work. One. So you don't depend on others. Yep. One, it honors God. It's a positive example for others to see. It gives the individual in the church credibility and a good witness. It also allows us to have resources available to help those when they are in need. It also gives us a sense of purpose and accomplishment. Think about how it makes you feel to know that you went out and did something. You know, God gave you the physical ability to be able to work. And we're using it for him. So what do we learn from this passage about people who are able to work but are not willing to? They're lazy. One, they're not living according to God's word. And two, we should not support them or give them any kind of resources or food is what the Bible said. Well, some kids are raised in a house where they get food stamps, get everything's free. Mm -hmm. So that's that's their lifestyle, so that's the way they live when they get older. That they're being taught. Being taught, that. yeah. And um, that's one of those things, that's why we have to come around and show them the right way to do. I mean, granted it's not their fault, but once they reach that age, where they know, oh yeah, they can change. But then they make their choice of, oh, well this was fun. You know, mom and daddy didn't have to do nothing. I'm not going to, I'm just going to do the same thing. That's not right. See, the cycle has to break somewhere because that's what God intends for us to do. Anybody else got anything on that one? The you last know, the part. Bible is law. Mm -hmm. God's law. Man makes law. Why does man change all the laws and the Bible don't change the laws? Because man wants to make it for them. That's right. They want to make it where it works out for them. Power. Power, <coughs> love of money is the root of all evil. And um, it's funny, we were talking about something similar to that yesterday within our own conference. The love of money is the root of all evil. And that's why I believe 100% when Jesus speaks in Matthew, when he clearly says not everybody that says, Lord, Lord, is going to go to heaven. There's going to be many people that are in church today, many pastors, many deacons, many teachers, many leaders, whatever you want to call them, will not enter heaven. Because the Bible says, not everybody that says it, but he that doeth the will of my Father. we got to make sure. That's why, that's why I emphasize so much. And I always quote what Paul says, to search out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Because you better know that you know. And one way of knowing is how you treat other people. If you don't treat them godly and lovingly, and you might not be one of his because Jesus came not to change any law, 
He came not to change any commandment. He came to fulfill them. But he only left us with two commandments. And the first one was to love the Lord thy God with all your heart. And the second one was to love each other. If we can't do that, then how are we think we're going to make it to heaven? Think about it. And in churches today, they seem to destroy each other. I've said it many times, the devil don't need to grab the world to come into the church. Churches are doing it fine on their own, destroying each other from the inside out. That's why we have to love one another. Remember, we're in this together. We were all created in, in their image. We're all one race. It's the human race. There is no color, even though that's the way the world wants you to think of it. Because God looks at the heart. And if he sees it covered by his son's blood, then it's pure. And he can see you. And if it's not, then that's our job to witness, to make disciples, to try to get people saved. And that's what we got to think about. But the problem is we get caught up with all these little things. We call them little things, but anything that takes us away from what God has commanded us to do ends up being big things. So we just got to make sure that we're loving one another no matter what. And I've told people many a times, you know, I didn't die on the cross for you, so I will not judge you. I can't. I don't have that right. I can say, hey, I don't see some fruit. Hey, the Bible says that this is the fruit of the Spirit, but this is not what I'm seeing. You can take the Bible to them, but when you do, you better make sure you're living your part before you try to clean someone else's part, you know. But go to them out of love. Work on it together. Say, is there something I can help you with? <clears throat> You know, but if you go there and you're ready to just slam the word of God against them, God's going to deal with you first before he can deal with them. And that's what we got to realize, you know. You know, I, my goal is to make it to heaven and to try to take as many people with me that wants to go. Because I can't force anybody to love God. I can't force anybody to live for God. All I can do is make sure that I'm doing right. And trust me, that's hard enough. And then me have to try to worry about making sure everybody else is doing right. I'll have no hair left. That's not a bad thing. Uh, <laughs> my, my, mine's not. Mine's turning color. It's just not turning out. Thank goodness. If it ever turns out, I'm in trouble. You get on your credit card on TV now. It says heaven or not. Dot net. Oh my God. <laughs> Find out. Wow. <laughs> the world, world is going bad. It is. It is. Pope, Pope says there's no hell now. He'll be, he'll be in line. He's going to find out. He'll find out. So they believe in purgatory, which there's no such thing. It's not in my Bible. Now, where they get purgatory from are the apocryphes, the parts of the Bible that were not included because they were not anointed. That's in that. And that's why the only people really that use that I've that I've read, I could be totally wrong, but the only ones that I know of that, that use what they call the apocryphes, which are the, the other books that were not included with the sixty six books in the Bible, is the Catholics. And that's where they get purgatory because it talks about it. Paul says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Okay? And then he also says, it's appointed unto man to die once, then the judgment. Now, do I believe that, because people call it Hades, it's written in the Bible. And um, I remember when Nelson was talking about it. Think about it like this, okay? There is a hell. And all those that have denied God, denied Jesus Christ, are going to end up in hell when time is done okay but where they go before that is exact almost the same thing because you have to think about it in revelations it talks about how they will come back up to be judged and then they will be tossed into the lake of fire okay 
that's not purgatory, okay? It's not them just floating around waiting to go somewhere. They're in torment because when the rich man died, he could see Lazarus over in Abraham's bosom. He was in torment because he asked for somebody to come and just dip their finger in water and touch his tongue. Okay, that was the torment that he's still in right now. Okay? But once Jesus comes back and takes the church home, then all those are going to be taken out of there and judged and then put in the final place with Satan at the same time. Still not a place you want to go. Okay, it's not purgatory. It's torment. And there's no do-overs. It's not, okay, well... I've been good while I'm in here burning and, and in torment. Maybe when I go stand before God, I can plead my case and go to heaven. No. If your name is not written in the Lamb's Book of Life, when you take your last breath, you will not see the kingdom of heaven. But you will see God. That is a promise. You will, say, you will stand before God and you will see him. But then he's going to tell you, depart from me, for I never knew you. And that's something you don't want to hear. You want to hear, enter in thy good and faithful servant. That's what you want to hear. And that's why I tell people this. I mean, there's so many people that have their own. And I tell people, believe what you want to believe. Because in the end, you're going to stand before God by yourself and give an account. But my Bible tells me not everybody that says, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. So we got to just make sure that everything between you and God is good. And that you're living the best you can. Because we're not perfect. Trust me, you're going to mess up. We do it every day. And until you make it to heaven, you're going to keep messing up. But you got to strive to live for God. Just do your best to stay as close to him as you can. I know we weren't going to finish all of it. But um, do your best and then let God do the rest. And if you need help... Remember what we talked about. Go to your brothers and sisters that you can trust and ask them to pray for you. But ultimately, go to God and ask God to help you. Because that's how we get through this together. So just make sure that you know that you know. And then you'll be okay. Lord, we want to thank you for this day that you gave us for Sunday school. Lord, I want to thank you for those that are here those that were able to make it, Lord, and we look forward to seeing what you're going to do in the worship service, Lord. We ask, Lord, that your will would be accomplished and that the Holy Spirit will have liberty to take over the service and to do what you want to be done. But, Lord, if there be one here this morning that's lost, Lord, I ask that through song, through the word, through testimony, whatever it may be, that the Holy Spirit will draw them so they can be wonderfully saved before they leave here today. And Lord, we ask all of this in your precious name that we pray.